Welcome to Lessons on Community and Improvement with Blue Jacket winner Jack. In this special event, we will be joined by Jack, winner of the prestigious Blue Jacket content competition. Jack will share his experiences in trading, the importance of journaling and community learning, as well as the reasons why participating in Blue Jacket could make you a more successful trader. Let's dive in and welcome Jack. First off, I want to thank you, Owen. Um, you know, the entire process of kind of migrating from footprint charts to bookmap, uh, you were actually one of the first individuals from bookmap that I was able to interact with. So okay. it's always been a positive experience with you. So I really appreciate that. And, uh, I just I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is kind of a great opportunity. Uh, I mentioned with you earlier that uh, it kind of overlapped into an interesting time where I was trying to transition software-wise, mm -hmm. and the competition kind of popped up. But uh, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you know Bruce and everybody else, and, and let's kind of get started here. Uh, right. So I guess we should get started kind of like with who I am. Um, obviously, I go by Jack. Um, many people also call me JT. Uh, I was a for I'm a former Marine. I was in the Marine Corps from 2004 to 2009, a little over five years. After that, I went to college, like many veterans tend to do, and I graduated from uh, the Texas a and schools in 2013 with degrees in Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and Mathematics. And at that point in my junior career as an engineer, I wanted to go to grad school. And that's, that was my driving force. I wanted to teach uh, and, and educate individuals in mathematics and engineering and uh so i went to a little ivy school uh, called lehigh in lehigh valley pennsylvania and uh and that was in 2013 and it was there that i came across a couple of guys uh, who needed some help with modeling uh, engineers and mathematicians are pretty well known for modeling using different software uh, they needed some help with statistics modeling and come to find out they were all traders, all in uh, New York City at this time. This was kind of the time where uh, traditional prop firms were still around, um, not the ones we see nowadays, which is, you know, like Apex and things like that. Uh, and it's, this is just a, a group of guys in, essentially on the floor there with tons of monitors and tons of different systems around them and trading their various strategies. And uh, they wanted help modeling just different financial models in general. And uh, it was there that I really uh, came across the Black-Scholes model and pricing and pricing models in general. That group of individuals was probably, they, they are still to this day, some of my most favored people. They're antagonistic and competitive yeah. and there's constant bickering. It is very much a sibling rivalry there, and they mm -hmm. all get along incredibly well. Um, and we're going to get into kind of communities in a little bit, but that is where communities for me started, was, was right there. I started with a great group of individuals, males and females alike. Uh, the females were some of the most ruthless traders, and they were the bosses, actually. Wow. Um, and, and it was... It was absolutely crazy and it was always interesting. And the reason I ended up trading was because of that antagonistic competitive rivalry. Um, they constantly challenged me. They constantly pushed me to try and trade. And um, little by little, um, I learned bits and pieces from each and every one of them. You know, some of them were dome traders. Some of them were price ladder time and sales guys. Others were uh, more traditional futures traders, commodities traders, and uh, probably one of the best traders is an options trader. She still trades options to this day, um, and she trades both her personal stuff and she also uh, assists and consults with a hedge fund as well. Um, and it's because of that kind of concept that I kind of learned various different areas of the markets as a whole. Yeah. And so 
um, that's kind of impacted both of those concepts have really kind of impacted who I am and, and how I trade and um, a little bit about some of that stuff was that I kind of really gravitated towards equities and options and futures. Um, I really liked seeing order flow and you could really see it with footprints. You can see it with time and sales. But when you're watching multiple instruments, it becomes very difficult to keep track of all of those things. And if I add another instrument or if I see something interesting, I'm at a disadvantage for my strategy because it's more stuff that I'm trying to watch in, an, in conjunction with what I'm already looking at. So I was looking to kind of simplify that process with the order flow, kind of try to consolidate my tools a little bit instead of just relying on, you know, footprints, TPO, volume profile, and traditional charts. I wanted to try to condense some of that. And that's where I kind of came across Bookmap. And it was presented to me by one of, one of those friends from that community, you know, almost nine years ago at that point. And they... They mentioned, hey, you might like this. This is more visual. You're a visual guy. Take a look at it. And so I really kind of did look at it. And this was uh, October. And I messed around with the, the delayed data, um, digital free version for over a month, just kind of testing things out, watching it. I'd sync my charts up with in replay mode with what Bookmap was showing me in the delayed data. And I kind of got a feel for the process. And it was right after that that you started um, another competition, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Oh, this is this is fantastic! <laughs> this will let me like really kind of explain my process." In in explaining my process, I'm able to kind of internalize my process a little bit better, and it's something that I've kind of found back from when I was in college. Was if you really want to try to know or see how much you know something, yeah. try to teach it. It's very true. And by the way, I'm uh, curious because uh, obviously I know that you're very good at journaling, you keep a lot of stats, but for the Blue Jacket competition, were, were you sharing things that you don't that, that you didn't normally write about or because you were trying to explain it to other people in the community or was it basically just stuff from your journal? So it was mainly my process that I utilize um, intraday because obviously I'm a day trader and mm -hmm. trying to document my process. Um, so it, it's things that I've, I've worked on consistently over the course of years. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it was just kind of like fine tuning my style into a book map atmosphere okay. and then presenting that information that kind of made sense with what I was seeing because yeah. visually book map is very different than a tick chart. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that's kind of where I was with, with that, that kind of journaling process. That actually really got me in depth into the platform. I, I managed to get my hotkeys organized. Uh, one of the biggest things about having something, a platform is getting the visual elements the way you need them or the way you want them so that they're yeah. easily recognizable. Mm -hmm. And you'll kind of notice, if you look at some of those charts actually from back when I was doing the competition, you can see that I'm, I'm changing colors or I'm I'm using solid lines or dashed lines, or mm -hmm. I'm kind of like changing things up, trying to try to get a feel for what I like in this iteration. Right. And yeah. uh, I've kind of settled on a process now that I really enjoy. And I, I kind of duplicate that process over and over again. Um, there's a couple of things that I still need to improve. Um, I would say custom notes and cloud notes are probably one of the biggest limitations. It's a mm -hmm. really big time sink right now to get mm -hmm. those organized properly. Um, and I don't really have a good solution for it. The spreadsheets are okay, but but yeah, that's that's kind of why I joined the Blue Jacket competition was the kind of, how am I gonna process and how am I gonna move forward with you know my, my iterative process, my, my journaling? How mm -hmm. do I move forward with it? And okay. uh, that, that iterative process is something that I was always taught was incredibly important when I first started journaling was something that I was always really, really taught to practice. Um, you can practice from a data analytics standpoint where you're, you're looking at your entries and in, in the probability of 
how they work and and whether or not you know you should be taking profits sooner and things like that and there's a lot of tools out there especially with some of the online journaling uh companies like trader view and trade sync and stuff like that that they have those kinds of elements um but for me it's more and it's always been more internalizing the process documenting mm -hmm. what i'm doing what i'm doing right what i'm doing wrong right. um looking at it from more of an order flow standpoint and this is kind of really important in in this concept a lot of times now i'll flatten a trade because i see something in the order flow and what i'll do is i'll mark it right then on my chart i don't necessarily have it all typed out note wise but i'll mark that i didn't like something in my in my chart mm -hmm. and after years of experience I've gotten to trust myself more than just letting my strategy go all the time. You know, if a, if you're a risk reward guy of like one to five or something like that, mm -hmm. and you don't interact with your trade until, you know, it reaches its profit or you get stopped out, there's nothing wrong with that process. Yeah. But for me, I've noticed that I'm able to see a problem with my thesis because the markets are always dynamic. They're changing. What you saw when you got into the trade is not necessarily what's going to be on the end of the trade and it's not necessarily going to follow through mm -hmm. so if i see something i will take profits off the table to make sure that i capture that maybe I, it's maybe it's reducing my position size so if i'm in four contracts i might go down to one right and then lock in those profits um something i also do um, is, is hedging flow and i'll get into that with a little bit of my strategies but mm -hmm. all of this comes about from journaling, from going back, looking at the footprint chart when I was using footprint, looking at the VP or the TPO charts and, and seeing what was there in time and then documenting that and then documenting my reaction to it so that when I come back across that problem again, I'm able to act in a better way to, to be more profitable, not just be profitable. Uh, and, and that's really why journaling was so important to me. Yeah. In this this whole iterative process. So can I ask what kind of things do you track? Because it's very easy to to overcomplicate things, uh, track too many things. How do you figure out what's the important factors in, in your trading? And also, like you you know, using the risk reward as an example, because you know if you're changing the risk reward, you take a two to one trade, but you close it at one to one, for example, you're then changing like the expected value of that trade. So, you know, maybe you want to see how it would have worked out if you let the trade run versus if you close it out. Do you, do you go really far into it or do you keep it as simple as possible and just look at a handful of um, factors in your journey? So initially i kept it very 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 detailed very detailed mm -hmm. how far um from um an opening range at uh entry point would go if it was crossing over the initial balance and crossing into the the volume profile uh, high area if we gapped down in the markets and we were in in a in a move up uptrend wise um i kept track of all of those things excessively and what i found was it wasn't necessarily worth it overall because what i needed was just good entries by getting good entries i've reduced the amount of losses i'll incur by just making sure that my entries are solid which is why a lot of the strategies that you'll see that i've, I've kind of trades and stuff that i've posted on twitter reddit bookmap discord it's always something that's like a break and a retest. And then we get order flow confirmation. So if we're breaking up into an uptrend and we retest a key level, I'm looking for buying pressure. I'm looking for a reduction in selling pressure or I'm looking uh, for selling volume to be decreased while volume is building on the buy side. And those things you can see visually with Bookmap very easily. And so I'm testing those key levels. And then I'll go from key level to key level. Well, the opening range every day might be 20 points. It might be 40 points. It just depends on the day. So if I have a one to five risk reward on that trade, I'm not going to be able to trade this five or six points because I'm risking one or two. Um, you know, I would need 10 or 15 or something. And 
for me, that's not necessarily worthwhile because I'm going for a specific target location yeah. as opposed to a, a, a one to whatever correlation factor. Yeah. And the way I kind of developed that mentality is more from an equity standpoint. This is kind of what I was mentioning before of how my strategies as a whole are kind of an amalgamation of everything that I've learned. And in equities, you might risk 20 cents, but you don't necessarily need $1 to make it. And you might not get $1, but you know you could get 20 or 40 cents with a dollar potentially at the bottom, but you don't know whether or not you're going to have enough order flow to reach that lower level liquidity. And you're not going to know until you get to that point because the markets are constantly evolving. And we can see this in order flow. We can see this in hedging flow. As price moves, people become more or less interested. And that interest directly translates to aggression, which is what Bookmap is incredibly good at seeing. Buying and selling aggression, which is all that moves price. You could have a hundred million limit orders in the book, but if somebody doesn't cross the bid ask spread, price isn't moving. And if yeah. price isn't moving, then you're not going to get a trade. So that's kind of why I look at these points and my entry is like, okay, well, I'm looking to risk this, and that's all I care about. I'm going to this target, but I know I might need a little more or a little less flex. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I see. I don't track those details as much anymore, and I track levels now more, especially with respect to like gamma levels. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because a lot of the prevailing market wisdom is that you know entries are not that important. It's exit, it's risk management, and so on. But of course, you know, we find in your entries would lead to a, you know a better a better edge or a, a wider margin on your trades. So, so that makes sense. Um, So what kind of things do you track right now? Right now I track uh, key gamma levels and those interactions and those points, any previous level that we've currently interacted with and what the reaction's been when we've got to those levels. Um, Mm -hmm. And I sort those by a measured level of importance based on volume at that level or interaction at that level. Like if we come to a level and immediately turn around from it, that to me shows that there's a lot of aggression at that level. And that's a very key level at that point. If we come to a level and there's a lot of back and forth fighting, we're crossing by the level a lot, that level is, it's a higher volume node and there is some sort of aggression there, but that might not be there when we come back next time. So I'll track those levels and I rank them by a level of, by an order of, uh, magnitude essentially i guess would Mm -hmm. be the best word and then that order of magnitude translates towards some of my strategies with regards to my opening ranges my hedging flow entries and things like that and then from there i calculate basically the probability of my overall trades my overall win percentages in these particular trades and i'll tweak little things to kind of help me in these trades Um, one of the things that i've done is uh I recognize that if I'm in in a key level where we've traded a lot, one of those higher volume nodes, and we're exiting that level, I've noticed that if that if that range is six, seven points, I'm not likely to get a very good entry, and I'm putting too much risk on the table if I enter with a standard contract size. So by by recognizing that, by recognizing those types of entries. I've reduced contract size on entry at those levels to reduce that risk. And if we get confluence, if we get the move that I'm looking for, I can look to add in. And uh, actually that's, I think that's one of the things you wanted to talk about was scaling entries. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's kind of what I look at is, is that kind of topic, right? Um, you're absolutely right. A lot of in- individuals look at, you know, you need a, a certain risk management, a certain profit threshold, in, in your entries not necessarily matter. And I honestly just disagree because okay. if you get the direction right, yeah. you should never lose money on the trade. Mm-hmm. You should. Even if it was a one to five and it came back, but it went three points, you should have gotten something from that trade. Um, 
there's there's mm -hmm. ways to see that it's potentially coming back within the order flow within the changing dynamics of the markets yeah. and if you get the direction right you just shouldn't have a losing trade that doesn't mean it's going to be a perfect winner by any means yeah. but you should always look to pay yourself and i think that that's something that a lot of retail traders don't necessarily do mm -hmm. because they're so focused on oh if i make this trade i only ever have a 30 percent profit target or a 30 percent win ratio do i need seven points yeah, yeah but if they're watching their trade and they see something in the order flow that's bad and they exit the trade flat in a profit they've still stuck to their rules i mean you're always able to override your exit point you don't have to go to your risk threshold and you honestly shouldn't a lot of times like if you see something working against you don't stay in the trade that's the whole point of the trade you know yeah uh, you don't also if the trade immediately works against you you don't have to let it hit your risk threshold to be entered like maybe you made a mistake on your entry and you just got in too early take it off yeah. if you don't like it um, and I, yes. I'm a big fan. And have I left profit on the table before? Have I gotten hesitant on a move that like it just didn't look good for a little bit and then it ends up going 10 or 15 points higher? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have I saved myself hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of points of the ES reversing in my face because I saw something and I didn't like it and I got out of my trade? Unequivocally, yes. I have saved myself way more by just paying attention and vetoing a trade. And, and that's kind of where I look at things. I am always in control of my trade. And if I make a bad trade, that's on me. But if I make a good trade and it's profitable, don't leave profit on the table. Take it away. So. And it's, it's a good point. I think it's something that retail traders suffer from a lot because obviously we have limited capital. We, we're always kind of swinging for the home run. So we, we, we may say, yeah, I need three to one, five to one, but it has to be based on some logic. So if you're using order flow, then yeah, it's only rational to close a trade if the order flow isn't right based on the way you look at it, right? Uh, by the way, exactly. uh, you mentioned uh, like exactly. a 30% win rate as an example, but I, I'm not sure if you're willing to share that kind of information, but what, what kind of win rate do you have approximately like just to, to get an idea so with of, my yeah. so i haven't done my calculations for this past quarter but for last quarter ending in december uh, my pat's win rate was 92 percent a little over um, and those average targets are four and six ticks with okay. runners at eight or more ticks typically um, sometimes those runners get stopped out at break even or break even minus one um, but the okay. trade is, is profitable 90 to 92% of the time. Um, so, and that's, that's uh, historically been the case for that particular strategy. Um, okay. I don't yeah. think I've gotten less than 90% quarterly on patch trades for several years now, but those trades, you might get two or three a day. You might get one a day. You might get nine in a day. It, it all okay. just depends. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's for, uh, very impressive win rate um but by the way are you recording like each trade individually or when when you scale in is that considered like you know uh, one position you know multiple scales so with, into... so with patch trades it's a uh, it's a it's a set entry um mm -hmm. and i use ninja trader for the advanced trade management strategies that they have in them um and it's i, I like a typical multiple of three or twos essentially. So whatever contract size that I'll enter in on, it's always a multiple of two or three for the most part, unless it's like a 10 lot. And those will always be um, one third at, at four ticks, one third at six ticks, maybe even a little more at that six tick mark. And then the runner will be, you know, the last couple of contracts that I might okay. take um, okay. for that particular strategy. And that's always, you know, a set entry. Now, on days where I'm not feeling the market, that gets scaled down drastically. I might trade two contracts. I might trade three contracts. On days where I'm, you know, trending or making like range days or things that I'm very comfortable in, it, it could be six contracts. It could be nine contracts. It just depends. Um, today, for instance, was a six contract day. 
Um, I expected relative range and we got relative range. So I traded my range levels and, and we can look at the charts later and you'll see that the levels just kind of played around each other really well um, for order flow. Now for paths, it, it wasn't a very good day. There was a couple of trades, but it wasn't anything that I was really interested in. Um, but I do, I do keep all of my trades separate. So if I'm taking a paths trade, that risk is all by itself. Those entries, those exits, that strategy is all into itself. If I take an order flow trade right after a patch trade, that risk and those entries and everything else are all by themselves. So they, I treat them completely differently. And then one of the strategies, and I'll get to kind of in a slide later, is hedging flow. I'll treat hedging entries um, on, on a completely different mentality as well. So if a trade's if I'm expecting a trending move and I'm looking for a target of, you know, 4160, for instance, and we're at 4140, if we get to 4150, 4155, and the trade starts working against me, I might, instead of getting out of that trade, I might take a counter trade with a different underlying in order to lock in those profits until I see order flow working with me again. And I actually kind of have an entire setup from yesterday. And this was one of the projects that I was talking about yesterday with you. Yeah. Um, that this kind of works into. And when I do this, I'm looking to basically capture those profits. So for every two ES contracts, you're looking at 10 SPY contracts, two ES futures for 10 SPYs. So if I'm long futures and the trade's working against me, I can hedge that with options, which is essentially what options were designed for. It's kind of hedging movements against you. And I'll take a long put entry with SPY contracts. 10 of them to counter whatever flow. And then when I see things are working for me again, I'll exit those spy contracts, scratch, small loss, nice winner, doesn't matter. And I've protected those ES profits and then that ES contract can continue going. Um, this is kind of really important when I have longer term targets in mind um, and kind of some of the strategy that I, I utilize with a macro standpoint as well as a, a positional standpoint. And I'll, I can get into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, for order flow entries, for my opening range, most of those are about 80 to 84%, um, sticking closely with the order flow. And I found that if I have too far of a profit target, that's where I incur the most loss. So if we have a really wide market, um, a really wide opening range, maybe it's 30, 40 points, um, and I'm trying to get towards that, that opening range higher, maybe I'm, I'm taking a failure back midline. Um, if it's a little wide, I've, I've, I've had issues with that. So one of the things that I've been looking at now is taking profit earlier and then just looking for another entry, you know? So... Maybe instead of trying to get the entire move in one go, I'll take a little bit of risk off the table, lock it in. And that way, if it does reverse on me, it's not negative against me. It's still profitable, technically. But I, I lock in that profit. And that's kind of goes back to what I was saying before is, is always pay yourself, right? And, and that's kind of a, a good mentality there. Um, for option strategies, uh, my, earning flow, my earnings to date, this current, what are we... Two weeks into earnings for this quarter, um, I had two major losers, Netflix and Tesla, which forced me to wake up incredibly early uh, in the pre-morning trading that you can get for the ETH before the RTH opens and either manage existing positions to recover or um, you know play damage control, essentially. Both Netflix and Tesla worked against me. Tesla, I was able to see working against me really early. So I was in a short before the markets really kind of shut down. So when I got up the next morning, that was yesterday morning, I think, I was finishing up that Tesla trade um, and basically ended up making a nice profit in the end, but my earnings trade absolutely went against me. Um, and that's, that's just Netflix and Tesla sometimes during yeah. earnings. They're just dangerous instruments to trade uh, when it comes to earnings trades so you just kind of 
live and die by the bullet sometimes with those. Uh, the rest are working pretty well. Um, I would say Eli Lilly is currently the, the the trade that's working the most against me right now. It's still profitable-ish, but from an option standpoint, I might have to roll it out because it might not be profitable if it keeps running up. It, the move is absolutely parabolic. It was 310 at the beginning of March, and it's 385 right now. And I, you can't expect... 85 points a stock to move $85 in two months like that's ridiculous um, so I would say that those those strategies are probably down in you know 55 60 percent um, you make a lot of money sometimes you lose a lot of money and you just kind of live to play another day kind of thing um, mm-hmm. but I would say that those are probably my core strategies um, I am working on tracking my my spot gamma strategies a little more actively but it's really tough to do um, i haven't found a good way to analyze those very well um, because they overlap so much with my order flow techniques i haven't found yeah. a good way to kind of kind of document that you know this one was because of something i saw within spot gamma's utilities and it can bind with order flow as opposed to this is just an order flow type trade. Um, so it's kind of, it, it's difficult. Um, yeah, I was going to ask how you kind of combine all those uh, strategies. Is it so you kind of go into one super strategy or you see them all individually and you trade them individually and separately? I am a meticulous individual. I trade them all separately, every single one of them. I, my futures, my ES futures contracts and that entire account is completely separate from my active management options portfolio. And that's mm-hmm. completely separate from my shorter duration options portfolio, which is completely separate from my book map futures where I can trade um, futures with book map because Ninja Trader doesn't really work super great with book map. Yeah. So I had to get a different account with uh, interactive brokers. Um, do, you, so, do you ever find yourself in conflicting trades in one strategy and going the other way with your other strategies? And you know that I could see how that may be a bit. Uh, hedging flow will definitely work that way for you. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, um, yesterday, uh, to to put in perspective, I was leaning long right off the start, and I had a I sold puts from four eleven spy. Uh, which was basically where we were at the bottom. And I was leaning long with ES contracts. And I had good intuition and good good insight and thinking we were moving higher. Order flow confirmed it. Hedging flow confirmed it. So now I'm in an order flow trade and a hedging flow trade at the exact same time. And right before that, I just finished two paths trades. Um, later in the day, that short um, those short puts actually became in danger and i was short the es futures contracts but in order to keep those puts because they're a separate strategy towards me instead of closing them i i added long puts to kind of lock in those profits and if it crosses and doesn't recover then they're okay they're safe and i'm, I'm covered there for whatever profit i currently had Meanwhile, my futures contracts, I can still interact with properly. What ended up happening is towards the end of the day there, uh, we broke back above the 411 strike. I closed out those 412 puts, those long puts that I had for a small winner actually, which was kind of nice. And then we proceeded to have a, a nice little strangle on the market there at 411, 414 and those expired worthless and we collected credit. So yeah, absolutely, you can twist yourself up. Um, And actually yesterday I made a a bad trade, well not a bad trade, while I'm stressing all these different strategies and I'm looking at all these different underlyings, I I do make mistakes sometimes. I moved my take profit um, too high on one of my trades, I think it was Google. I don't remember exactly which. And I ended up getting stopped out um, with a trailing stop. It, it was still overall profitable, but the trade was going for another 50 cents or a dollar. 
and I got stopped out on just a, a normal pullback that I would have never really have done, but I was pulled in too many different directions a little bit, and I just made an error. And that happens occasionally, and you just got to roll with the punches on that. Sometimes you're going to make a bad trade, or you're going to make a make a mistake. You got to got to get out of it. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that's important though is if you do it, exit immediately. Like if you got mm-hmm. if you enter short, you meant to enter long. For instance, exit. Don't even if it's working against or working for you right away. Don't change your thesis. Just exit the trade. Yeah. Take a step back. Look at what you did wrong. Adjust. Take a breather. Make sure you're collected, and then reassess the market. Right. Yeah. Um, too many people will enter in the wrong direction or they'll make that kind of mistake. I mean, it's a common mistake to make occasionally, especially if you're slightly distracted or you know, you're pulled in too many directions. And when you do that, exit, get out. You know, you, you weren't wanting to make that trade. Even if it's working for you, just, just get out. It's fine. If you got a little bit of money out of it too, bonus, have a nice steak dinner at the end of the day, you know, but yeah. uh, I didn't jump right back in that trade, even though my thesis was, yeah, it's going to go longer because that those kind of rules that I have for myself with that, I made a bad trade let the stock go, let it breathe for a minute. I'll come back to it if I see something still, or if there's a pullback that I'm comfortable with. I do not chase breakouts. I do not chase them. If they're, if if it's ripping 50 points without me, it's ripping 50 points without me. The, I've been trading for so long now, the amount of times I've seen the market just rip 50 points out of nowhere, you're going to miss some of them. You're not going to catch them all. So you don't really need to try. So... Yeah, very well said. Uh, it sounds like you're very disciplined as well, though. Not everybody has that. I guess uh, your background also helps with with staying disciplined. I, I would say that my parents being Marines, my grandparents being Marines, me joining the Marines probably had something to do with it. Uh, and it was honestly greatly reinforced by the, the first few people that I got into trading with. And they were they were meticulous. They were... You know, there's, there's a guy, I swear you could program a TI-89 calculator to show the price ladder or the DOM, and he'd be able to trade it effectively. Because he's so meticulous, so particular, he's in and out with his strategy, and he doesn't deviate from it. And he's probably the most profitable trader I've ever known. And that's all he does, is just sit there trading multiple instruments, all the different futures, looking at the domes and trading them actively. So you could be profitable using any strategy, but you can't be profitable if you're not disciplined, if you're not focused, if you don't stick to your rules. And a lot of the stuff that I see in the retail community is, you know, on Reddit or Twitter or sometimes in in Discord conversations is, um, I didn't follow my rules and my trade worked against me. How do you follow your rules all the time? And honestly, it's just, you just have to do it. You have to, you have to figure out how to wake up in the morning, right? You need, you need to figure out how to set your alarm when you go to bed and wake up with your alarm. You need to figure out how to, how to pay your bills on time. This is no different, right? This is just one of those things where you have to put a level of responsibility on the task and follow through. And if you're able to do that and iterate through your process, you absolutely will become profitable. You absolutely will. Yeah. Because you'll see what doesn't work. Yeah. I think the problem with a lot of traders is that they don't even know what the rules are because they have no understanding of the market. They don't know what their edge is. So obviously they're going to trade randomly uh, and they're not going to follow the rules because they don't believe in them. They have no understanding of the strategy, what, what to expect in terms of drawdowns or or you know win rates and so on so yeah and that's really where kind of communities can come in hand yeah, yeah. Um, whether it's you know just somebody you know who trades or it's a mentorship room or a reddit reddit channel or a discord or whatever having other individuals who also trade those instruments and see the market from their perspective they're going to give you some sort of insight now with the vast majority of misinformation in the retail markets, you need to parse that information. But if somebody sees something and they say, hey, 
you shouldn't have done it because of X, Y, Z reason. Give it credence. Take a look at it. See if you can see what they're seeing and see if that makes sense to you and, and iterate through that way um, and, and kind of lean on that. And I think that retail traders, they look at this too much from a home run standpoint and they look to take as much profit as they possibly can. They're looking to compound their ro- their returns by you know, 20, 30, 40%. And if you stop and think about it, you know, on average, the stock market's what, like 13% not counting or counting dividend use. Um, it's less if you remove the dividend portion of it. Um, you're not going to get 30% returns. You're not going to double your capital in a month consistently, right? Yeah. And if you do, you're probably putting on too much size mm-hmm. and you could diversify yourself so much better. You know, instead of, instead of trading... 20 ES contracts, maybe continue trading the four or six that got you where you are and take the rest of that capital and look for more long-term solutions like covered calls in the options market or look for different underlyings that you can utilize. And just kind of focus on those aspects and don't get locked into, I need to make, you know, a thousand dollars every week to be profitable. Or I need to make you know ten thousand dollars in this quarter or something like that, and that kind of pressure that you put yourself under, it it can create a bad atmosphere if you allow it to. And I, I think that that's something that a lot of newer traders kind of struggle with is that they're not able to separate that portion of trading away. They're they're looking at this from a this has to be my job. I really want this to be my job. And they put so much pressure on it and they do all that pressure without the experience needed to truly succeed in the long term. You know, maybe they were profitable for a year, but if you take a trader who was profitable in 2016 and you would dumped him into last year's market or even this year's market, there's no telling if he'd be profitable now because the markets are completely different and you have to be able to iterate through. You have to be able to adjust who you are trading wise to the conditions of the market. I know a lot of friends who I try to help with different kind of aspects in the market, ranging markets absolutely destroy them because they want to get in on a trend and it's going in an uptrend, but it hits its you know upper bound range and then it turns around and reverses on them. And now they get stopped out for a small loser or scratch or no profit or small profit. But, you know, they're looking for 100 points, 200 points on a CFD or something like that. And instead of just kind of recognizing that implied volatility is low, you're not likely to get a large movement in the market. The expected move for the day is only, say, 40 points. (coughs) Excuse me. If you take a look at today, for instance, uh, the upper bounds, what, 41.58 and the lower bounds... 4136, the entire range is 22 points. That's not even a full percent. So kind of paying attention to what the market's giving you and trade what the market's giving you as opposed to being stuck in one strategy, um, I think is is yeah. kind of really important. Yeah, very good points. But it, it, it's, it's that community stuff. Like you need feedback. Um, there's, I push trades still where... I love it when people ask me questions like, what are you looking for here? What does OR mean? What is, why were you looking here? And the reason is, is because, you know, that that feedback tells me that maybe they don't know something or maybe I didn't explain it well. And either way, it gives me an opportunity to do something that improves myself. Because by explaining something, I'm again, internalizing that profit, that process a little better. Mm-hmm. And by educating, I'm also kind of just, providing myself more confidence in my own trading methodologies, right? By by showing somebody else what I see and helping them see the markets the way I do, they're getting confluence in that mentality. So I think feedback and, and back and forth is really important. You need people that are slightly better than you and slightly worse than you. And it's it's that amalgamation of both groups that can make you a better trader. And if you're all working together, all of you are going to improve at different rates sure but all of you are going to improve 
and that group of people is going to constantly get better. Uh, and I think I think that it's incredibly important. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, you, you, okay. You want to go over your your trades uh, that, from the competition, or did you want we, to we say something? We can go over else? the trades. So okay. just quick kind of trades that I take, like we mentioned before, I take uh, price action trading. These are kind of is is popularized by a gentleman by the name of Al Brooks. There's another gentleman who's really prevalent in the scene, um, Mac um, from Pats. I only know him from his YouTube stuff. I've, I've only seen what he's done and he's, he's a good soundboard. And that's that kind of community aspect, right? These are, these are people who post their stuff and what they look at in the markets. And you can compare what you're doing to what they're doing and see from their eyes and maybe gain some aspect there. Um, I also trade with trendline rules, which we'll see a little bit in some of these uh, some of these kind of entries. And obviously, order flow, uh, opening range, initial balance, imbalances, um, which I look at as more of sweep reversals. Um, positional analysis. I took this terminology directly from Doug's webinar. Um, mm -hmm. I had never really called it that before. I called it uh, gamma positioning. Um, so it's similar but different. And this is just how the options complex is positioned within the different underlyings mm -hmm. and how that can kind of impact trading. And we talk about that a lot in the options of Doug channel. And then hedging. This is something that I developed more over the last two or three years. And it's locking in profits when trades are working against me, but I'm still confident in the trade in the long term. Um, and that's provided a unique opportunity to kind of gain some overall um, profit there kind of like that that spire trade that i mentioned where i went long puts at the 412 mark collected those at 411 when price reversed back above and i saved my 411 short puts so um you wanted to go over a couple of them the the first one is kind of this opening range breakout failure it's right here in the book map discord um and mm -hmm. There's so many this great is, trades, it's hard to pick them out. But yeah, I wanted to, you know, <laughs> just maybe, because obviously you, you write a lot, you've, you've written a lot about your trades, but maybe it would be good just to go over it again and, and explain it yeah. even deeper. So th this, uh, this fits right in with, this is the bread and butter of my trading styles. Um, Pat's trades are trades that I can always rely on in every market. It doesn't matter, up, down, or sideways. Um, they're, they're just great trades. They're few and far between, though. So you might get two trades a day, like I mentioned, you might get nine trades a day. But opening range, you'll generally test it at some point in the day, and you'll generally get several points on it. Um, now there's variations. You can, you have the opening range high, the opening range low, and the midline. And what these are is when the markets, it's the, it's the top and the bottom of the market in the first 30 minutes. I mean, the reason why I use 30 minutes and I don't use initial balance nearly as much is we see the most order flow at those points. That's where positioning is really happening in the market. And if you're pivoting, there's a reason you're pivoting. And what that tells you with order flow is for whatever reason, at this specific point, the aggression reversed. The counter aggression was so much stronger that it absorbed and rejected price. As an order flow trader, that's incredibly important to recognize. You're recognizing that the order flow itself has the chance of reversal, and it gives you a point to look at at these areas. Because if it happened once, it could happen again. Um, now, it might not happen again as well, you know, because there's success and there's failure, but there's trades on both sides of those if you know what you're looking for. This particular trade is the order flow breakout failure edition. And it starts at the, at the beginning of the day, right? We get this large sell off um, kind of at the start here. Let me go ahead and make this bigger. So that's the good. first uh, 15 seconds, actually, that's not going to work because it cuts off the timestamp. Let me just right. scale it for you. There we go. We get this large sell off right here. Um, and then we kind of set the lower bound here, right? At, at the 4035 level right around this nine o'clock area and then we kind of get a get a pullback and um this uh, this opening area where we started price action at ends up being our opening range high um 
and you can see that we get a pull back to midline, we push back up, but then we kind of just sell off, and you can see this large sweep. This is 12 points in the matter of probably 45 seconds or so that I was watching in real time, and you could see the bid ask is narrow here, like or not narrow, it's very extended. You can see prices jumping two, three, four ticks. And there's actually a sweep that's right here. I don't have the sweep indicator on though. Um, and you can see an iceberg order is picked up right here. Uh, by the way, I can't actually see your mouse. Uh, what you could you? I can. Uh, I can do this right here though. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we got that. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. we get that sell off here. We get a nice little reversal here, right? And then following that, in this area, we get a large sweep that's occurring. And it runs right into an iceberg right here. Yeah. And then we can see that it's breaking down. And it actually breaks down below the opening range. Now, what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for price to come back above and then to break down lower. So I'm expecting that if this, this push lower is going to work, it's going to pull back and it's going to come back down. And then it's going to test this range. And then it's going to go lower for my strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's on, if I was to take it lower, that point right there is where I would want to take it lower. But what you see is instead, price breaks down, it rejects back up immediately, but then it never breaks down again. Never breaks down again. And we see that there's this imbalance right here. You can see where the bid ask spread is very, very, very narrow or very wide, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And this is actually my entry. Yeah. Because we've, we failed to actually break down this, uh, this area right here. And this provides me a good entry. Now, when I'm taking this kind of entry, I'm looking for the midline. Uh, and for my particular strategy, we don't always hit the midline perfectly. Um, I always aim right here, two ticks before the midline. Pretty much 100% one of my take profits is right there before the midline at some point. Um, and it's just what I found works really well. Uh, and if I don't do it, I found that price gets, you know, one tick shy of where it needs to be and then just rejects and I lose profit. So, and I'm sure every trader has had that where your take profit is one tick farther than where, where the price actually goes. And you're like, ah, one tick, that's all I need. Um, it, this is kind of how I've adjusted that strategy to kind of compensate for that, if you will. Um, price is moving very strongly right here, though. So I'm looking for price to actually continue longer. So I'm taking that profit out right here, and I'm looking for some sort of confluence at the opening range high. Um, and this is where I get my first two profits. And as you can see, we butt up against this area a lot. But here we go. We got a break, and then we're testing it, right? We come down, we get a little bit more support right here, and we get a little bit of resistance. And you can see right here, look at this order flow orb. You can see the selling that's coming right here in the delta and the volume dots. This is telling me that selling is currently leading, and if it stops at all, if that sell side aggression stops, buy side aggression is going to take over very quickly. And what we get right here is that right there. We get a lack of seller aggression volume wise, you can see because the book map changes the size of the nodes based on the amount of volume traded. Mm -hmm. And then you can see that the spread is widening right here. This indicates that there's likely a sweep here. I don't have the sweep indicator on right here, but that's likely what it is. It's a small sweep probably of a couple of ticks. And that lack of volume right there provides me a really good entry right here on kind of a support and confluence. This is also somewhat of a two-legged pullback. You get the first leg down right here and a second leg down. That tells me that the downtrend is potentially done and you can start looking to go long. And that's kind of a two-legged pullback methodology as well, kind of adapted into this. And that's what I'm looking for from the order flow on this one for a continuation. Um, and, and that's kind of what ended up happening here. I think it, on this particular trade, uh, I'm pretty sure it went up to about 40, 57, 40, 58 or so. And that's where I ended up getting profit out. You can see kind of right here, it's consolidating up and down. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it, ta it tagged up here a little bit, and then it just kind of rejected a little bit lower back into back into the range, if I remember right, or, or tagged this uh, opening range line. Uh, but that, that's what I'm looking for on this. And this is this is that breakout failure edition. So if it fails to break out, I'm looking to go the other way, and I'm looking for confluence in the other way, and I'm looking for my key levels for take profits, and then I'm out of the trade. Um, I, I don't necessarily need that whole, you know, one to 50 kind of reward on this particular trade if i remember correctly my i lost my cursor here um on this particular trade i believe my entry was like right here like i said i believe my stop loss was like right here it wasn't even outside the opening range it wasn't at the swing low which you'll see so many traders do right that adds two three points to your risk and if you're trading from risk to reward that two or three points risk and you're trading like a four to one or a five to one means you need 10 points. So if they're entering at 38, they need 48 by their own strategy to get there. You might get there. We do in this case, but how often do we see that trades just go kind of right here to this area and then just reject lower? And that's a losing trade at that point, right? Because you're you're stuck with that, that one to five risk reward and you're not watching the order flow reverse on you potentially and you don't get out of the trade profitable um, that kind of goes back to what we were saying there but this is this is this is bread and butter this is this is what we look at um, a lot of other times um, we're not really going to cover it here in the three examples that we have i'll look for a trade that breaks out finds resistance and then continues on and i'll look to enter about right here Mm -hmm. It's the same concept, right? So this is the first first leg up, pull back, second leg up. I'm looking to get that second leg. So um, that's that's kind of that. And then if it was on the downside, it'd be the same concept. It'd be uh, it'd be oh, it's not working now. <laughs> uh, it breaks down, pulls back, and then continues further. And that's the two legs right there. And, and your entry is is right here and you'll see a lot of my trades that are just like that so that in a way if, if i'm looking at that ignoring the order flow and just looking at the price section it, it kind of just looks like your 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 confirmation for the entry is is like a lower low for a short or like just before a lower low you'll be getting short and just before a higher high you're getting long is yep. that a good way of looking at it yep that's exactly a great way to look at it exactly um lower lows and lower highs are something that are I document those and I mention them a lot more in equities because I'm not looking at levels as much, uh, but mm -hmm. it's the exact same concept. They're just two different applications of it, right? Yeah. Um, and and lower lows and higher highs and things like that are, it, it, it's all about that kind of price action that I'm looking at. Um, and that gives me a clue as to what I'm looking for. Um, with equities, I don't necessarily look so much at the individual orb. Like if you look at this orb, like this is all buy side right here. Mm -hmm. And this is all sell side. I'm not looking at the delta on those because I use actual like full dots on those. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the volume and what volume is kind of overwhelming price for equities. So I utilize lower lows and lower highs a little bit more. For futures, um, my ES charts, I'm looking more at this, this delta level. I care more about this. This is, you know, buying pressures coming in, selling pressures coming in, mm -hmm. those things right there. I'm looking at that a lot more often. Um, but yeah, lower lows and lower highs is actually a, a, a great way to look at it. Um, and it's it's one of the things that I'll mention a lot in the in the sub notes. And then mm -hmm. I think the second one you wanted to look at uh, was scaling in and out of positions. Yeah. Um, this is this is a fantastic topic. Um, okay. It's also very nuanced, and you need to find your own risk threshold with this and it, it, trading is obviously always risky but you need to find kind of what you're doing so for this i'm not entering on a specific opening range i'm not entering on a specific price level or volume level i'm entering on a overview a macro standpoint where i feel that the market is going higher based on our positional analysis and our trend the previous day. And it feels like we're gonna have a continuation of that, especially because 
in the overnight market, we had no action whatsoever after a large trend day. So the thesis for today, for this specific day was that mentality, but that's a lot of risk, right? Like if you go mm -hmm. in with your full position size and you get the move wrong, yeah, you're out your full position size at whatever risk threshold you were. So you, you just can't do that. Um, and I'll do this a lot with equities too. I'll take a fractional position. Maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 30%. Um, I don't remember what it was on this particular day. It was probably two contracts to be perfectly honest, because that's what I sized down to a lot of times, but I don't remember. It could have been as low as one. Um, and, and that's what I'm looking for. Now, once we get the move that I'm looking for, I'm looking for some sort of kind of pullback to get into a position, right? And on this particular move, You'll see this a lot in in the actually you see it today as a matter of fact you saw it yesterday uh, you see it today in Tesla the market goes initially one way and then reverses mm -hmm. um, that initial pressure is just absolutely consumed by the reverse aggression and you'll just get a reversal Tesla did it in the opposite direction it pushed up today and then immediately collapsed back down at the 164 all the way down to 161.5 I believe. Um, that's what I traded it today on. Um, and you see this, right? Um, what you get right here, this particular level right here was a gamma level. And then just above it, you can see there's a double bottom. You can see it really well with the order flow. If you're using a traditional time-based tick chart, you're not going to see this unless you're looking at a one minute tick chart. And there's so much noise in that, that you're not really able to see that. Mm -hmm. There's just so much noise. You'll, you'll fake yourself out way too much using a, a one minute time chart. And a lot of people use a two or a three when they're doing equity trading. So we get this gamma support. We get a good push up. We get the higher highs that you mentioned. We got a double bottom down here and then we get a higher low. This is a great setup right here, right now. Cause now I've got this, this green trend line that I'm drawing, right? I can see that we've got some confluence here. We get another higher high from before. So now I'm looking for an entry. I can see all of this stuff right here. We've got this pre-market support. We can see this clear level right here. So I'm looking to get in. And this is where I enter right here was it was this yellow circle. But I'm entering with that fractional position, right? Because this is still a fairly consolidated range. This entire trade this entire volume for the first 10 minutes is only what six seven points but i'm mm -hmm. feeling that we're going to kind of break out and that was kind of my thesis going into the day enter with a small position and what would, this kind of what would be your or what was your invalidation point in in this case in this particular case it's definitely going to be down here if we break below it's actually probably going to be right below this gamma level because mm -hmm. this is a good support yeah. If we get good, if we get good support at a gamma level, I'm looking for. Now, if I see something that's drastically wrong, if all of a sudden I enter right here, and we get a small push up, but price immediately starts rejecting back down hard, I'm gonna go flat. Because yeah. that's that's an order flow that I wasn't expecting, right? That's if yeah. we get a, a sudden immediate visceral reaction, that's not what I'm looking for. I don't mind a little bit of back and forth. I don't mind a little bit of choppiness. Um, but if we get something that's just completely counter to what I'm looking for in general, that that's absolutely no go, get out of here, run away, don't trade that. Um, obviously in this particular case, we didn't, we get this, we get this higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, and then we get a consolidation pattern right here. And this is fantastic. This is where we're able to scale in because you can see right here in the order book, in the heat map, we don't have any liquidity. There's nothing right here. It's barren. But as we break above this level, this 4,000 key level, that psychological point, all of a sudden we get a lot of traders in the order book supporting price. Mm -hmm. How do they support price? If they're arresting, they're arresting order, right? So if price tries to sell into them, they're in the book ready to buy. 
meaning that they have to have enough aggression to get through all of these orders before price truly reverses back down below this 4,000 kilo. This is a great support. This is exactly what you want to see to scale in, and you get this kind of consolidation pattern. Um, this, a lot of people might call this a, a, a bull flag. You know, If you look at it in a small time frame, you'll see a bull flag. Um, Bruce talks about this a little bit. The markets are fractal. They're mm -hmm. geometric. You scale in, you're still going to see the same things as if you scale out. Yep. This concept applies right here for sure. Um, if you do this on a larger time frame, you'll see something that's more like this. And what does that form? That forms a wedge. And what happens with a wedge? Typically, statistically, price will return the direction it entered the wedge in, typically. Mm -hmm. It's not always the case, but it typically will. What happens after it enters that location? It will generally come back and retest that location and then continue further. And actually what we see here is exactly that. Mm -hmm. You see that standard wedge pattern, a breakout above, we kind of do something and then we come back and we test our same breakout level. Um, and that's why at this point I didn't scale out. We had the support I was looking for. I didn't scale out. Now for my trend line rules, this is also part of my trend line rules. If we're in a direction, we call that the macro direction. In any break of that direction, we call a micro direction. So we get an overshoot in this particular case of my trend, right? So my trend is, is this line right here. We get an overshoot. We're very parabolic at this point. So I expect some correction at this point. And I want that micro trend to resolve before I'm really looking at a new entry point. Um, and you can see that right here. And this kind of overlaps with what I said before with my setups. <clears throat> I'm not looking to get out here on this micro trend this downtrend, I'm looking for a new extreme on my uptrend and I'm looking for my micro trend to resolve. And you can see that I get a resolution of my micro trend. They're basically the same level. I get a resolution of my macro trend. And at this point, we either have consolidation, reversal, or continuation. And what do we get? We get a higher low and we get a continuation and I scale in. For a continuation and you can see that with the order flow supporting right here in the heat map and that's kind of what yeah. scaling in and scaling out of a position would yeah. look like <clears throat> if we broke down this point right here if we broke into this area i'd look to scale out a little bit more because we're passing where i would look for that wedge right i'm looking left on my chart if we if we pass down below this area I'm looking to scale out of my position a little bit. Now, that scaling out would be almost net profitable because we scaled in around this range. So it might be within a tick or two of that. And so that risk is almost zero, right? Because we're okay. And our initial entry is way down here. So overall, the entire trade is still very profitable. It has to reverse all the way down here before anything is actually bad for us. So right. that's kind of how I look at scaling in and scaling out. As I'm looking at where do we get support before? Are we coming back to that area? Are we breaking down below it? Um, in equities, you'll see me talk a lot about the, the quarter dollar, the half dollar increments, which you often see price pull back to. I try to call them out a lot in those equities charts because that's my expectation. Is that I'm calling out where I expect price to go. And if it violates my expectation, I'm out of the trade. So... That's kind of how this one works. Now, the other one, and you wanted to talk about a third one here. And this is support and resistance with uh, high, volume, high volume nodes and everything. Mm -hmm. um, high volume nodes, when I'm dealing with order flow, are essentially no-go zones. I don't mind if I'm in a trade and we enter a high volume node and we kind of work through it a little bit but I will not enter a trade on an initial break of a high volume node because too often I've gotten burned on it. So 
I'm looking for us to clearly break out of it and retest at a higher point. And that's what you see in this particular area right here in the bottom area. This is the high volume note that we entered before. Um, and I'm in this trade. And at this point, I scaled out of my trade a little bit right here, looking back when I look back at it. Um, and it's because we were coming into this high volume node. I didn't mind a little bit continuation. We end up rejecting and continuing and we find support. Um, and this support you can see is the same that was resistance. And you often hear a lot of people talk about what was resistance can become support. What was support can become resistance. This is what you're looking for, for in bookmap. You're looking for the points where you were struggling to break now being areas where you're struggling to break below. Um, and in this particular case, you can see that the the order flow is a little light in some of these areas. You can see that mm. the volume orbs are relatively small and we're not getting a lot of large selling pressure. But then you look in right here and you can see a little bit more these green, these green flags. It's hard to see them now, but if you kind of interact with Bookmap a little bit, what you'll notice is that's the bid ask spread. And nobody's hitting the bid, meaning that they're seller exhaustion. The bid's pulled back a little bit, meaning that any buy side aggression that's going to occur is likely going to continue pushing price higher. Now, we get it there, and you can see it again at the bottom just below. But you can also see it on the sell side, on the offer side as well. We're getting a little bit of um, sell side exhaustion or buy side exhaustion as well. So we're kind of stagnating. And what ends up happening is if you zoom into this one, you get that same kind of bull flag pattern that forms that little micro wedge, and then we get a breakout above it. Um, again, markets are kind of fractal. So we're kind of looking at these areas for support. And this area, when I looked at the chart a couple days later, ended up becoming a high volume node. And you can kind of see it here. So if we think that this is a high volume node, just like this one, you can see that as we're here, price is moving very quickly, very quickly above and below. But as we get into the area, it's very choppy. There's a lot of volume being traded right here. And then as we break the area, we get sharp movements and then we get more chop. And then we kind of break down. And as we break down, you can see that we get a retest and then continue breakdown, retest, and continue breakdown. We kind of step, stair step down. Um, and that's kind of how I look at high volume notes. I'm looking for, okay, and in the order flow, are we getting any kind of uh, exhaustion in my direction like that I don't want? And are we getting any aggression or exhaustion in areas that I do want? Like if I'm long, are we getting uh, exhaustion on the sell side? Then buyers are going to be more aggressive or any aggression that we do have is likely to continue pushing price higher. So I'm okay with my trade. If we're getting um, buyer exhaustion and sellers are going to have more of an aggressive advantage and they're going to continue pushing price against me. And that's against my order flow. And I'm going to look to kind of get out of that trade. And that's how I look at volume nodes. Um, and I still utilize volume nodes. They're more on my traditional chart to keep track of because the traditional chart, I'm able to save those three sessions visually as opposed to book map when I close, drawings don't necessarily save. So I've thought about tracking them and I messed around with tracking them in cloud notes, but I haven't found a good process to kind of work through that yet. So and I don't know, maybe if I can find a method that works well with it there, I'll, I'll kind of kind of do that. Uh, but that's that's the three examples that uh, I did. And this is, this is something that I was putting together yesterday that I was telling you about that I'll mm -hmm. post later um, in the Discord. This, this is, is a lot. This is a lot. This is, if you're going to read this and digest what's actually going on, it's going to take you 15 to 20 minutes. This is my entire morning, yesterday morning, and how I looked at the markets. And it yeah. started with the pre-market 
started with, you know, Tesla having a bad earnings. I know I'm short coming into it. That means that now I've got to wake up earlier than normal to make sure that I get into the ETH session, that I'm continuing my Tesla position. And you can see that here. I'm also looking at the ES and I take two PATS entries in the morning. I'm just going to kind of scroll through this a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we get the RTH open. And this is where I'm looking at the new order flow. Now, even with earnings, there's no reason for the market to be down hard. And you can see that we get this large sell-off in pre-market in the ETH session from where we are. Typically, in this gamma environment, in this macro environment, I'm looking for price to continue to push back to this area. That's my thesis. I'm looking for any reason to go long immediately. And in spot gamma hero indicator, you can see we get the RTH open and you can see right off the rip, we get order flow going in the right direction. And all it is, is uh, overnight puts are monetizing. And by monetizing, they're allowing hedging flow to take, take off that pressure, that downside pressure. And then we're getting call side confluence as well, meaning people are long calls, mm -hmm. um, which is something that Doug talks about often. And what do we get? We get a rip right off the start. I was long basically immediately. I, I literally just hit the market buy button and just went long. Um, and that it was because of this setup. I was ready for it. I got what I needed for my confluence and I just sent the trade straight away. Um, and this is me tracking it. This is all happening real time. Um, so you can see that this is 930. This is 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. I'm watching this while I'm watching book map, while I'm watching my traditional charts mm -hmm. and I'm setting up my order entries as we're going. And I'm not just watching the S and P I'm watching Amazon, Apple, uh, Microsoft and Google and Tesla to some degree, but Tesla was pretty much done. So I wasn't really worried about it. So it kind of backburned And I'm watching these two charts on those five underlying at the same time. And I'm constantly looking at where things are going. This was an incredibly trying event because watching them and executing is one thing, but watching them, capturing the images real time mm -hmm. and making trades was probably one of the hardest things I've done in a very, very long time. <laughs> and it was just a lot of micromanaging and juggling. I was juggling 15 balls at once and I, I'm yeah. not, I've never juggled before. So it was, it was very, very tough. Um, we could see that we get this continuation of this. Uh, this, is, this is Amazon. Same concept. Right off the rip, I see the same thing. So immediately I went long on Amazon, ready to go basically. Um, looking at the breakdown, you can see that it's callers are buying contracts, pushing price higher. And you can see that if you back out, I, I take a little later time stamp, you can see that this call buying continued and this put monetizing, this put selling back um, also continued and continued to push price higher. And then we kind of get into Apple or Amazon, excuse me. And you can see that this is where I'm long right here, literally right off the rip. I'm looking for clear liquidity right above us in the heat map with book map. We get it. I've taken my partial entry out at this point. We find support and this support is right at a, right at a quarter dollar increment level. And we can kind of zoom in a little here. Um, you can see that it's, it's right at that 75 Actually, this one's a little bit lower. So kind of pull back a little bit more. Um, we do get support though and continue on. Um, and that's that's kind of real time and I'm looking to kind of continue this trade back towards the S&P now that I'm looking there. Um, and this is kind of continuing. This is kind of looking at things. This is a little further on. This is about 45 minutes into the trade. This is something that a lot of people who are watching the, the order flow on Bookmap probably noticed. At this point, that's a large sweep that entered the market. And it pushes price down very quickly. This is something that has happened over the last few parts of the week, and I noted it in my pre-market setup. This is how SPY reacts. This is what it looks like in Bookmap. And everybody kind of knows the sweeps indicator. This is so incredibly frustrating if you're in a trade and all of a sudden you're up six points and you're down two points because mm -hmm. you get this large sweep. And I have been tracking this algo sweep 
all week, like I said, and I was trying to set up a counter imbalance entry. And every time price from the ES got to that level, I was always working on something else and I couldn't get an order set up for it. Um, and I kind of notate this, like, um, I, I want to, I want to prepare for it. And if I can prepare for it, I can set a limit order um, because I was long futures. I can't set a limit order in futures to kind of sweep those couple of ticks. Like I would usually do um, with, with a limit sell order um, because it'll cancel my contract. Cause it's, it's first in first out with futures. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't have diametric uh, positions at the same time due to NFA rules. Um, you can't short it with MES or with spy, which is, a lot of times what I'll do, you can also short it with SPX, but SPX is a lot of margin. Um, and I just don't like tying up that much margin for no reason. So for, mm -hmm. especially for something so small like that, I'd rather do something more significant. Um, now, like I mentioned here, that I'm also watching Apple. Um, it's, it's kind of migrating around. It's not really doing anything. Um, it failed to reach its liquidity point, so I'm looking to maybe get short at this point. You can see that in the, the image here. Um, but we don't we don't have any entry, uh, and price just kind of just rejects right past where I want to go, and then we don't even get any support right after. So I'm looking for some sort of like support and pushback in order flow, and we don't get anything significant. We just get you know just kind of a melt up and a relatively short period of time and I don't get any real confluence with my trade here is kind of showing a little bit but that's clearly not leading and it's not a leading indicator in this instrument right now so it's kind of frustrating um, and you can kind of see that with how price is kind of like just migrating the same as as the hero indicator and that means it's not necessarily a true leading indicator it's kind of following mm -hmm. so it didn't have a good entry there uh, I, I usually like to trade my, Microsoft. I was set up to trade Microsoft. It did absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. I I looked at Microsoft multiple times because I'm setting aside mental energy for it. And every time I look at the book map, it is just chop city. And I guess I, I never even took a screenshot of it because it was just nothing that I could trade. Yeah. And I was incredibly frustrated with it. Apple and Microsoft are frustrating at this point. Um, and going back to that sweep, um, you can see later on what ends up happening every time we come back to price. He's there, ready to go, sweeping price lower. And you can see that if you're ready to go for it, you can easily take a couple of points in either direction. You can either ride the sweep on the way down or you can hit a market buy order uh, as soon as it happens. So you can either buy going up or you can ride the sweep going down. There's Either way, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you know that it's coming, you can always take a point or two. Now, this I learned from footprint um, stuff. And this is something that some of the more traditional guys who are very rigid in their footprint order flow, they'll talk about like picking off weak traders. This is one way you can kind of do that. Um, you get a sweep stop run, you can go the other direction, take a couple of quick scalps and then walk away. and, and you know, if you're doing that with two or three contracts, it's, you know, $50 per move per point. So it's really good. Um, this is a strategy I noticed in Google. Um, I, I notated it here. I've actually documented this a few times in some of my trades. You see this large hero imbalance. Shoot us down, price rejects. You see it shoot back up. I'm looking to get long now. Now, if you look and see where it overlaps, you can see that, you know, we get this kind of resistance point here the push higher, and that's kind of this area right here. And then we get this push down, and then we get view up support. And this is a great entry. This is this is where I got in. Um, and I got in because of this order flow that I, that I talked about right here. I'm looking for it. I get exactly what I want. I see the weakness. Um, we're immediately buy side aggression. You can see the green orbs right there before. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking long. Looking to get this point right back. We get it. I take profit right here. I'm looking for continuation. We get the continuation. I'm looking higher. We failed to get higher. And this is where I told you about the mistake I made. This mm -hmm. is it right here. This is my, my stop was too tight, my, my trailing stop. And 
it ended up just stopping me up. Now, it ended up working sort of, like I didn't give back this profit, but what it caused me to do is I now have to pay more attention because my risk is down here. I've already collected a lot of profit up here. So I'm in a fractional position right here. So I don't mind if price comes all the way back to VWAP on me. That's fine. That's that's part of the game. VWAP bounces happen all the time, especially in equities. But because I made this mistake, I now have to watch Google for this you know seven minute period and try to get a good entry. And I've got to watch the order flow. And then I see a good entry and I'm able to get long again instead of you know just mashing the entry button right here, right? Because that trade is separate. So technically, if I wanted to have a risk, it'd be right here. Well, I'd be underwater risk at this point, hoping that price rejects higher. And if you're trading on hope, you're not trading a profitable trade. So that's that's not a good rule set for me. So I always wait for conditions that I'm looking for, finally get it here, and then we end up pushing higher. Um, I'm still looking at this this liquidity point, which we did reach later on. Um, kind of notated it here, and then I don't think I actually got a screenshot later. Maybe I did. Um, Amazon kind of flashing back. Um, I was looking short. We ended up getting short here. Uh, it's kind of a triple top right there in the image, um, and then to push down lower. I was getting short right here, and you can see that uh, right around here. This is the hero signal. Um, and I'm kind of short, I believe, right around here. Uh, we get a little bit of a bounce right here. And then, again, my risk is like right above where I entered. So I take my profit right in here. Uh, I think I took some right here as well. And then price comes back here, and I'm out, and I get flat. And that's, that's still a good trade. I took profit twice. You get stopped out on the rest of your position. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, this is kind of the same thing. Uh, we're looking to kind of break down some of that liquidity area. Um, and it ends up breaking down really well. We get the confluence that we want. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good trade overall. And then Amazon goes sideways. So I was short on Amazon uh, from that previous spot. This is the same image as before. You can see we're still looking for order flow going lower. We do get price kind of chopping around, which you see at the right on the left image there. And then price kind of goes this way and then does nothing. At this point, I got out of the trade for the last little bit of percent that I had. And we can see that uh, the E-minis are building up. And this is right before the melt that we had in the beginning of the day, that, that early melt um, to 10.50 from like 10.60 or whatever. You can see it building up in the hedging flow. And this is something that Doug talks about often. You can see these things if you're paying attention and you're ready for them. Um, I'm looking to hedge my long position because remember, I'm long ES contracts at this point. I don't want to give up this profit, so I'm looking to short SPY. Um, and that's what I ended up doing. I ended up hedging that position. And here's what Bookmap looked like at this point. Um, so I'm short SPY coming in, and I monetize at this point, and I get flat because I no longer need to hedge because we're we're past where my risk was. So now we're continuing on the uptrend. We make a double top. And now I've got more risk again because we're breaking down. So mm -hmm. I have to re-enter my SPY short. We get a really quick uh, push down. And then we get that sweep yet again. That guy, absolutely not mm -hmm. a fan of him. Uh, he was there all day, absolutely ruining stuff all day for people, yeah. stopping people out. Another 300 people were stopped out here. And price ended up going all the way down here. And I was able to capture all of that with SPY contracts, mm -hmm. um, watching the order flow, watching the hedging flow, and be prepared for it. And this is just kind of the hero showing that kind of stuff breaking down. Um, now, these are kind of the images that I was looking at throughout the morning. And you can kind of see how the flow is changing as the day kind of moves on. You know, this is like the 1015 part, and here's 1015 here. And then here's 10.15 on this image. It's over on the left-hand side of it. And you can see how these flows are continuing to break down and build up. Excuse me. And that means that if there's weakness at a key level, 
there's potential that price is going to break down. So you can look to get flat at these kinds of levels. You can look to trade in the direction of the breakdown. You can look for confirmation. Um, you get a higher high here, but then you get a lower high, and then you get a lower high again, you get a lower high again. Maybe you're looking short right now, right? If you're looking at those kind of mentalities. Uh, order flow, you're going to see something very similar. Um, if you're a pullback trader, you know, you've got one pullback, a second pullback, you could be looking to go short right here if you're a two-legged pullback trader. So uh, there's a lot of lot of confluence there. Um, and it was this stuff the entire morning and this is how my day goes pretty much every day. I'm looking at Google, I'm looking at Tesla, Apple, Apple Amazon, whatever looks like it's going to be moving, I'm looking at those equities and I'm also looking at futures. And I look at trading them in all these different ways. And this is how I take all the different trading styles that I have and I apply trades at any given point. I'm looking at hedging flow, I'm looking at a pads entry, I'm looking at order flow in general. Um, and this is how I can look to trade all of those those aspects. And then down here at the bottom, I kind of discuss um, that kind of end of day price working against me. I went long puts on SPY to protect my short puts at the 411 mark. Collect a profit on those. It was also short ES contracts at that time. Collect a profit at that 411 key point as well. Locked in everything that I needed and then my what ended up being my spy strangle, I didn't set it up as a strangle, I kind of legged into it, um, ended up working incredibly well. Um, I was able to get uh, short puts up here and then I got short calls up here at the 4170 mark, which was that key level that I mentioned I was looking for earlier. Today's key level that I was looking for is 4150-ish, 4159 on uh, ES. Um, and, and we've kind of been trading around that area right now for a little while. I don't know if you've been looking at it at all, but that's kind of where we've been. You can see that in book map here. Um, we're up at that key level. Um, this uh, actually, this is really interesting here. So we opened a little higher today. You can see where are we? There we are. So technically we opened right here. So my opening range high should be this point right here but we opened so hard and so much higher than i expected i actually adjusted my opening range high right here and this is something so i do I, occasionally so it's a, and so yeah, i'm not sure where we're looking right now because um oh because it's orange yeah, yeah no, a second. no I, I i i'm still looking at oh is it not yeah sure? okay no, no okay not maybe now try again is this your book map now no, now now it's just pause the stream. Um, maybe okay. you're only sharing one screen or something. I'm not sure. It's sharing the whole screen, but Bookmap no. is on the screen. Um, actually, I can, if you, if you don't mind, I can restart and then I can show you this yeah, section yeah. and you can kind of edit it together and post if you want. All right. Okay, give me a second here. Oh, that's not going to work. There we go. Go. There, you should be able to see book map now. Um, hang on, just a second. It's okay. Yeah, yeah I got it. Okay, cool. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, um, no, no that's problem. the difference with Discord streaming versus OBS streaming. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we technically opened at this area right here, but we pushed lower. And I knew that kind of this, this opening range wasn't quite right. So I pushed this line right here, this orange line. And this kind of is an adjustment that I've made. Um, I've noticed that sometimes when we open a little awkward, that the opening range isn't quite a good overall setup. And I need to adjust that, you know, a couple of ticks in one direction or whatever. And what you'll end up seeing here is that position ended up holding perfectly. We get this right here, we get this right here, then we come back and this is where I was taking profit from an earlier trade. And then you see it again. We hit it again, we hit it again. There was lots of opportunity early on. And then if we go to where we are right now, 
in the markets, you can see it yet again. We're right there. Um, now, this area right here, it didn't really provide a good opportunity for my trading style. I don't know if you can see it in the red, in the blue there, I'll put it in red. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not really great for my midline setups because we don't get a clean retest. You can see we kind of violate the, the level every time or we're above it. So I'm not really looking at a trade here um, at this particular point. If I would have had a trade, it must have been, it would have had to have been at the low, maybe. Hey, here you go, here's a low. This would have been a good opportunity for my opening range low. So we broke down, we find support. I would look to get profit right here. Uh, we get support again, so I'm looking for continuation. Um, we haven't quite got it at this point, but the risk is down here and we've already made profit right here. So break even is all the way down here ish somewhere around this range right so we're completely safe on this trade if we were to let it ride and then you can see that you know it kind of rides and it goes actually to our target eventually um so maybe would have been a longer trade if i'd have taken it i might not even have taken it just depends on the individual day but that's kind of how i look at the markets as a whole in in trade and that's how i use book map to kind of organize that and all of these skills were skills that are developed by just participating in the in the competition. I, I like to journal. I, I journal actively throughout the day. I mean, obviously, that line was there well before our conversation. Um, and that this is kind of notating these aspects are, are how I participate in the market actively and how I stay engaged. And by staying engaged in the markets is really how I can... Uh, trade them really well it's how i found my edge personally that's fantastic jack i'm i'm really grateful for you taking the time to uh, go through all this with me i'm sure the community is going to find it fascinating um there's a lot to digest but some really interesting Here, stuff it, it's it's nine years of built-up strategy okay. and execution and evolution of stuff so it's and I probably didn't explain everything with the the true nuance that it deserves, but it, it's it's kind of how your your trading process will, will build, right? Like you're not going to be able to pick up every single thing that I did, and you shouldn't try. But you should find one thing that does work, and then how mm -hmm. do you build off that one thing? And just like a Lego set, start with a couple of Legos and build a tower. And then once you got a tower, build a castle. And once you got a castle, build a kingdom. And then once you get that point, you've you've got a large overall portfolio that you can trade actively and it starts with one step what what is it that you see what works for you what are you able to execute well and what are you able to take profits with not be profitable but take profits because as long as you're paying yourself consistently you will eventually tone that strategy and tighten up that risk reward. You'll get better entry conditions. You'll get better exit conditions. And from there, you'll be able to build so much more than anything else. So um, I, I hope that people are able to take good stuff from this. And if they have questions, obviously I'm in the Discord. I respond basically to everything that people ask me. So I'm always around if people wanna ask questions, whether it's about the platform itself, whether it's about my perspective on trading or even your trades, like maybe somebody took a trade and they don't know what, what they did right or what they did wrong and they want some feedback. I'm game. Feedback my trades. If you see something that I did wrong, hey, I'm going to learn from you just as much as you're going to learn from me, right? So, and that kind of goes back to communities in general, right? So being interactive in the community, don't just be a listener. Be, be somebody who talks, be somebody who speaks. Provide your content out there, which is scary, right? It, it, mm -hmm. it's hard to put yourself out there, but by doing that, you'll internalize the process so much better. You'll become a better trader overall. And all it is is risking putting yourself out there to a bunch of strangers over the internet on a trading thing, right? <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're trading paper trading or money trading. I'll tell you the honest truth. There are days where I don't like the market and I've made a couple of trades and I'll turn it sim mode and I'll still trade the market. There are days where I'll try a strategy that I don't think will work and I'll execute it in sim mode. There's nothing wrong with paper trading. There's nothing wrong with 
real money trading, the only thing that's wrong is not putting in the time and the effort. You've got a bit, you've got to put the screen time in. And if you do and you practice and you iterate your process, you absolutely will become successful. It's about that process. You're never going to be, you're never going to be a pro football player if you don't get into the gym and you don't work out and you don't practice every single day. You can't just do it on, you know, given time. Like you've got to actually execute and you've got to practice. You've got to put in the time. And that's what trading is all about. And we see a lot of that in some of the communities here. Tom's uh, Traders Lab, they constantly dialogue. They're really big about building a narrative. Doug, for instance, he's really big about structured mechanical process. He looks at the markets the same way every single day, and he looks at executing his trades, doing those strategies. And these are communities that are have been here for a long time. And Bookmap's still building new communities with, you know, the Algo Boys and with uh, J Trader and his his programs. And um, they're getting even more guys with with uh, Charles Gao from uh, Pirate Traders, Options Millionaire. So find who you react with when trading, how you can kind of see the markets and maybe somebody who sees it similar to you and gravitate towards them. Learn a little bit from them. Help teach other people. And through learning and teaching, you'll, you'll gain a strategy. So I hope everybody can be successful. I really do. I really wish every single person was a successful trader, except the people who don't put in the time. Because then we can take money off of them yeah. and make ourselves profitable. That's very well said. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> Thank you very much for everything. I appreciate the time, buddy. Thank you for joining us for this special event with Blue Jacket winner Jake. We hope that you found his story fascinating and informative and that you were able to take away some valuable insights. As you move forward in your own trading journey, we encourage you to consider participating in the Blue Jacket competition and taking advantage of the community you are a part of. With dedication and hard work, you too can achieve success in the world of trading. Sign up to Blue Jacket today at www.bookmap.com slash bluejacket. Thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to bringing you more valuable insights and stories in the future.